Good morning, good morning, good morning. And I am so excited to be here this morning and to welcome you all. And I have the song that um, I picked for this particular event. And so I hope that, um, and now I don't own the rights to this song for um, just technical legal purposes. But this particular song is actually about um, Lazarus, a song kind of about being dead and then being brought back to life. And so as we enter Holy Week, I hope that you'll look this song up. It's, it's sung by the group Cain and it's called Rise Up. And it just talks about going from this dead person in a tomb and making a choice to be able to go out of the tomb. And, and it just says to just rise up, to take a breath because you are alive now. And it's very um, encouraging. And, and I love the concept of Jesus calling us out of the grave. And I believe that Jesus is truly calling us every single day to, call, to go out of the grave and, and, and imagine, if you will, what it would be like for Lazarus. Um, in those moments. And so I do hope that you'll take the time to look the song up and listen to it and look up the lyrics and see exactly what it says. And so um, let me see if I can turn that down just a tad. Um, and so I want to welcome you to the anticipating resurrection event. And I, I'm, I'm super excited. I mean, just even doing some research on Holy Week was very enlightening for me. And um, yesterday was actually Lazarus, I mean, sorry, day before yesterday was Lazarus Saturday, and then we had Palm Sunday. And so I want to say good morning to Diana, Joanne, and Sarah, and all those, um, and those of you who are actually watching um, later, I don't want to disregard you either, but um, I just want to thank you for joining us. And so um, let me see if I, I'm going to have to do a little bit of um, um, tech uh, for just a second. And um and hopefully you'll give me a little bit of grace as I make sure that everything is up and running. Good morning, Shanice as well. Um, so let's see. Every day, so every day this week, we're going to be uh, hosting three different speakers, three different speakers. And the whole idea was for them to tell a portion of their resurrection story, the personal resurrection story. And so hopefully you'll be able to take the time to go and uh, research those, watch those, and then identify yourself. You know, where are you in your resurrection story? And I, you know, the interesting thing about doing this, I, I got very, I actually went and got my box of Kleenex, okay, um, as, I was, as I was preparing for this moment, because there's something extremely powerful about hearing people's testimony. So a friend of mine who lives back in the um, city in um, uh, California that I had left recently, they had 23, 26, 28 baptisms yesterday. And she was telling me about it. It was just, it was just phenomenal. And there's a portion of the scripture where it actually says that we were, we died to, um, we died like Christ and we were buried in the tomb and baptism and then brought back to life. And I just, you know, and she just said there was like father and sons that were baptized together. And she said the reunions and reconciliations were phenomenal. And so just thinking about all that and thinking about this week of hearing that and the fascination that we get about the spiritual renewal of people and being able to watch people be brought back to life and being uh, resurrected per se um, is, is just so inspiring. And it's, and it's, and it's, uh, yeah, a joy, just a joy. And I think most of us know that if we have new believers um, in our, our midst, whether it be a church or in our community, how exciting that is. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, as you're watching, just type in where you're watching from so that um, we can get a view of all the different places that uh, people are tuning in this week and how exciting it is to know that we are a global church. We are a global church and we get to impact people around the world simply by taking a step and moving out into the, the internet, honestly. And so I am going to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping and then message and homework. And, um, and I'm kind of covering the announcements already really just looking at um, what, what's happening in the days to come. And so, a little bit about who I am for those of you who don't know me. I was uh, raised in the church, so I was one of those people who was raised in church every time the doors were open. However, sadly, um, I was molested, raised by a child molester. I was molested by my dad um, the entire time, who was actually very high in the church. And so there was a day that, um, I mean, thankfully, my brother stood up for me and told my mom. And when my mom confronted me about that in front of my dad, 
And my dad was just lackadaisically sitting on the couch behind the newspaper. And when my mom asked him about it, he says, I don't know what she's talking about. And that was the end of the story. And so it was really kind of sad that here I was raised in this really strange um, environment. And, and thankfully, Jesus came along. And uh, when, I, when I was confronted with my spirituality by somebody in the church, I, I couldn't even answer that question. I, well, I didn't, they said, where's your relationship with God? And I couldn't even answer the question. So uh, when I said, I don't really know, we prayed a simple sinner's prayer. And so that was when I was about 23, 22, 23 years old. And so thankfully, somebody took the time to ask me that question. And, and I'm super, super thankful about that. A lot of things have happened since that time. And now I'm extremely grateful that God has honored me with it, the, the giftings to be able to come to you today and to share with you my story. Um, I was super, super shy, and I could not conceive that this would be happening today, let alone hosting an event uh, with other speaker women. So I'm very, very uh, honored by that. And so, and so, and so, and so I use that a lot, don't I? Um, what are we doing and why are we doing this? And so, if you read the, the, the description, I, I believe, I truly honestly believe that we should celebrate Easter more than we celebrate Christmas because Easter is like where all the power came from and the resurrection the power, the resurrection of life, all of those kind of things and being able to walk in that power and, and to say, how can I give honor to God? How can I give honor to God? And then we had all these women. So I run a free group for women Christian leaders and also a, a private pay group. And some of the ladies in those groups were saying, let's do something. Let's just do something to prove that revivalism isn't dead. And so in January, we, we hosted an event very much like this, where we had 31 speaker women that spoke every single day in the month of January. And, and then they're like, hey, let's, let's like keep going. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do that. And so I was like, all right, let's, let's think of something different. What's, what can we do next? And I thought, let's honor Holy Week. Let's, let's do something where we just talk about resurrection every single day on the, on the path to Easter. And so figuring out how to come up with something different. And we came up with three speakers a day for each day, Monday through Friday. And today is actually Fig Monday. So yesterday was Palm Sunday. And I think Pastor Sarah had her palm branch and she was, um, you know, singing with her palm branch, which I thought was really cool. And today, apparently, people actually eat figs in, in honor of Fig Monday, which I did not know until I started doing some research. But that's why we're doing this, because I want to give women an opportunity to speak and to have a platform to, to speak, but also because God is worthy of being honored. And the power of the resurrection is, is really why we're Christians in the first place. And so to take all of that and combine that into an event to me is really, really fascinating. Awesome. So we have Arizona, Missouri, Kentucky, South Carolina, Texas, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Colorado, Louisiana, West Virginia. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so excited. You're welcome. That's it. Um, uh, yeah, you can share this event, by the way. Uh, you can just click the little share button under the video and you can share it like in your on your own newsfeed so that your friends can watch it as well. So those of you that are speaking later, just so that you know that. Uh, every day this week, same time, 6 a.m. noon and 6 p.m. PST. So specific times, 6 a.m. noon and 6 p.m. And that way everybody who's everywhere should have an opportunity to at least watch two of them and you can always watch the replay. So how to die well, how to die well. Palm Sunday was a day of celebrating joy and anticipation of the King. So they were really excited, right? Really excited. And, and, and it's fun to think about all that excitement. And I, and I remember when I was first writing this, uh, I, I wrote this down. What are some things that make me angry? So we have this, this joy and this happiness and things that make me angry. So there were three things that make me angry. One is bad drivers. And I've had this, I've had this issue with bad drivers. Like if you're a bad driver, like really gets to me. And I, and I spent some time thinking about that. What makes, what makes that most me, what makes me angry about that? And so I don't know what kind of things make you angry, but if you can type that in as you're thinking about that. I realized that when I was a teenager, I was in a car with my, my boyfriend and his brother, and I was sitting in the middle and we were driving through these, this area of town and we were cutting across. We realized instead of making left, just make a right. And there were three lanes of cars, but all the cars were kind of slowing down and letting us cross through. Well, so those were all at the light but there was that last lane that was going to be turning. 
and, and they were just coming out and they actually broadsided us. And I, all I remember is looking up and seeing the word Jeep on a grill right at the window before the impact. I really believe that, that that's what caused that ongoing fear. And I have to work on that, right? So bad drivers and then people who misuse scripture. I've only, I've only yelled, so I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and an ordained pastor. And I've only yelled at a client twice in 20 years of doing professional therapy. And one of them was um, somebody who was misusing the scripture about wives being submissive to their, in, in my office to their, you know, the Bible says, you're supposed to, I mean, I just like, no, you are not going to misuse scripture in my office. And so really that, that's another thing that really kind of gets to me. And then also the enemy. I mean, the enemy, think about it. Uh, I just, anytime the enemy is getting the advantage, it makes me angry because I believe that the power of Christ is more powerful than the, than the, the enemy. And to, for us to learn how to utilize that and to, and to uh, take power away from him, it just makes me mad when he shows up. It makes me mad when he takes advantage and it makes me fight harder. And so I think I was a bit tad angry while writing this message because the, 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 just thinking about how the enemy is keeping people from living the life that, that God has called us to. And yeah, I just don't like it when the enemy seems to be winning. And I think about those who still need to come out of the grave like Lazarus. So when I listened to that song earlier, I think in my mind, and this is what makes me teary eyed, of the people in my life that are very close to me that are still in the grave. And Jesus is calling, Jesus is calling. And we're just like, come, come, come out, you know? And, 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 and so, um, you know, anger covers pain. And that's something that I've, that I've preached for a long, long time, but to really look at those people who were still in the grave. And I remember telling somebody who was struggling in their faith, I said, you're, you feel like you're in a cage. And the problem is, is that you're standing with your back to the door and the door is wide open. And if you would just turn around and walk out the door, you would understand what freedom is. And so as I listened to that song and I think about those people that are still in the grave and, and just saying, hey, come out, come out, that you can breathe now. It's, you know, you have the breath of life available to you. Jesus is calling. And so my message will cover three things. What does it mean to die? How to die well? And then the incentives to dying well. And, and I know I, t I, told, I, told my, I told the rest of the speakers, you got to do this between 20 and 30 minutes. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, but I could go on and on and on about this particular topic. Right? <laughs> so, so I'm going um, so to try to keep some of this content um, short. And I want you to really be praying, God, help me take out of this message what you want me to hear and how to apply it to my life. So what does it mean to die? I, you know, what does it mean to die? So I just looked up the definition of death and it says no longer alive. And so it's pretty basic. But the second one was the permanent ending, the permanent ending of vital processes. So somebody type that in, the permanent ending of vital processes. And I want you to focus on the word permanent. So there's vital, like there's, there's vital processes, right? Things that, that are necessary. And when they end, it's permanent. So permanent, the permanent ending of vital processes. Yes, thank you guys for sharing with me some of the things that make you angry. Yeah, ugly words, bad drivers, judgmental people, lack of empathy, yes, yes. All right, death, the permanent ending of vital processes. So, I want you to think about what are you hoping to accomplish before you die? Thank you, Julia. What are you hoping to accomplish before you die? So some of the things like own a home, some, some people like they just, they really want to own a home. What are some of the things that you're hoping to accomplish before you die? Some people want to have kids. Others want to have grandkids. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we, we really want to accomplish. Some people want to own a business or have a successful business or a ministry or even own a nice car. And I'm not saying that um, any of these things are bad. These are just like normal things that people desire before they die. Um, intriguing vacations, intriguing vacations. Yes, owning a home, be a grandma. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah, I like that, Angela, the permanent ending of viral processes. Wouldn't that be great if the viral processes of COVID would be permanently ended? That would be beautiful. Um, yeah, the permanent ending of vital processes. And so um, that leaving a legacy. So the pressure, as we get older, the pressure gets, it gets um, bigger because time gets shorter. And, and we're like, we, we have these things we want to do. And, 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 and we look at death and because death is final, right? The finality of death is getting closer. And these, there's these things that we want to accomplish. And, and I heard uh, most of you, well, I shouldn't say most of you, some of you might have heard of Christine Kane. And I saw a video of her. I saw her live. And then I went on YouTube and looked her up. And I, and, and her live was just phenomenal. She's a great speaker, just great speaker. And she talked about the goal of the Christian life is not to die safely, not to die safely. And she gave this picture of, okay, I've got my house and I've got my white picket fence and my two and a half kids and my dog. And I got my ni a nice um, bed and I've got my blanket. So now I'm going to lie down. And now that I've got all this and the end has come, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rest and I'm going to die safely. And she says, you know, if, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die doing great things for God. I'm going to die doing great things for God. I'm not going to die safely. So somebody type that in great things for God. I want to die doing great things for God. And I was just fascinated by that. She goes, so I'm going to do this and do that. And she goes, you know, who would have thought that I would be going against the mob in Europe um, in order to rescue girls from the slave trade? She's like, I'm just going to go do it. And if you actually heard the backstory of Christine Kane's upbringing, very, very fascinating that she'd go from that to this. And, and so thinking about how to, to die in a way where you're risk, risking, you know, like living riskily for God. I just, yeah, I just, that, that's, that sermon for me just changed everything about the way I look at my life, my ministry. Yes, great things for God. And so Jesus, Jesus died well. And I put that picture for this event of Jesus on the cross to think, you know, Jesus died well. And we think, well, what, what did he do when he died well? And, and the thing that he did was he put an end to sin. So he put an end to the power of sin. And so I will read you a portion of the scripture. And, and I typically, and I, because of, because I have this like ADD personality, I don't typically tell people where, I mean, when people are um, telling me their passage, I'll end up reading more of the scripture than listening to what the speaker says. And so I try not to tell people where I'm going to read from until later, because then they'll get distracted by the, by that. But some of you are going to know, because I know you, um, the end of the power of sin. And I want you to think about this. It says, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Again, so living to God, dead to sin, right? And in the passage, that there's this one little segment, and I heard somebody preach on this a couple of weeks ago, and I went, oh, that's what I want to preach on. In, in a particular version, there's this phrase, we died to sin. We died to sin. So somebody type that in, we died to sin. And then personalize it, I died to sin. And so when we talk about dying well, I want you to think about dying well to sin. Can you die to sin? Can it just be dead in you? No more sin. We died to sin. And it says in the scriptures, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. And I love that, instruments of righteousness. Now think about it, you think about the instruments and then in another version actually said weapons, weapons to righteousness. So if our bodies are now weapons to righteousness because we are dead to sin, we need to learn how to die well, to die to sin well. Jesus did that, he did that fabulously, right? Pure, pure righteous, died to sin. And and so in, uh, it says, we died to sin, we cannot live it any longer. 
Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that Christ Jesus would just, just as Christ Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That we may live a new life. And then um, you need to, you need, you need to be determined. You need to be determined to be done and dead with sin. Just done, done. And 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 in in, in uh, my my challenges and stuff, I was talking about this. So you got to be done. There's got to be. You have to have a conscious decision. Decide. I'm going to be done with this. I'm going to be done with this. Once you decide, it's the power of Christ that allows you to walk in that doneness. It's not us. It's not us just just bootstrapping our way through this and just like oh I got to you know we say God. I am done with this. You, you give me the power to be done with this and to walk in new life. And I get grieved by hearing people who say, well, I sin every day just constantly. And I just know, and there's like all these other things that I, I know I haven't even been aware. It's like you live in this constancy of fear and dread. And, and I, and I'm, and I understand the philosophy behind that, but it keeps us from being able to walk in the glory and the power of Christ because we're looking at the fear of not being aware of this, these sins that we're doing, instead of saying, how can I be aware of the aliveness in Christ in me? Because I have died to sin. I have made that choice. I've received Christ as my savior. I'm here to honor God well with my life and be a weapon of righteousness, a weapon of righteousness. And so I want to read to you uh, Susanna Wesley's definition of sin. Now, Susanna lived in the 1600s into the 1700s. Okay, so this was a tad while back, right? But it's so applicable today. And I want you to read this. And, and I, you can look it up uh, online anywhere. It says, take this rule, take this rule when thinking about the definition of sin. Whatever weakens your reason whatever weakens your ability to reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things. So it's anything that just makes you, you know, um, you're, you're avoidant of, of spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of body over the mind, that thing is sent to you, however innocent it may be of itself. So again, it's not saying, well, other people are doing this, or it's not that bad of a thing, or, or the law says it's okay, or the church says it's okay, or my spouse says it's okay. It's not the innocence of the thing that itself, it's the impact that that thing is having on your spiritual life. So let me read this again, whatever weakens your reason. So think about the things that make you, um, that your, your reasoning is impaired, anything that makes your reasoning impaired, that impairs it. Oh, so, so the example that I will give you is, um, I used to argue that alcohol was not gonna send me to hell. And I still believe that today, but I used to argue that it's like, ah, you know, because I wanted to have the justification of being able to, to, to do that. And then one time I was drinking, and this is like way back in my, you know, early twenties, um, I was drinking and a bit tipsy and somebody asked me about my faith and I couldn't do it. I could, I wasn't clarity of mind. I could, and I, and that was, it was a so stunningly clear to me that, that this was just impacting the king. It was impacting truth. It wasn't, you know, so yeah, it was just, I, I couldn't, I clearly remember that. It impairs the tenderness of your conscience. So anything that makes your conscience um, hardened, you know, things that harden your conscience, obscures your sense of God. Think about all the things that we do. And, and, and we can't experience God because there's just so much going on. So anything that obscures your sense of God in life or takes off your relish for spiritual things. I, I, you know, there's so many, so many things um, that, that make you uh, avoid, especially uh, political things, you know, when you are the political pressure, the social pressure, not to talk about your faith, not to talk, you know, and it, and it takes the relish off of it. Instead of being able to walk in the joy of the spirit, we have a lot of um, um, fear over that. Increases the authority of the body over the mind, where you're you're gratifying the body in whatever fashion that is, over the mind. I, 
any any time that that um, I mean, you can look at scripture where that's all over the place, right? Any time that you do that, it is sin to you. It is sin to you, no matter how innocent it might be. Okay, be repulsed by sin, die to sin. And I hate to bring up this next comment, but um, um, because I know that often my family, um, and I was uh, adopted by the people who, who abused and molested me. And so my biological family sometimes watches these recordings and I know that it's hard for them and painful for them to hear some of the things that, that, um, uh, that I went through. But the phrase that, that um, I wrote here is my parents set me up for failure. So the people who raised me, they set me up for failure they brought me into the church and they showed me how to live an extremely hypocritical life. And, and so I was really set up for failure that there was no way that, that I was going to ever see church for the truth of what it was, that there was genuine relationship with God. I mean, it was extremely ritualistic and we, we prayed the Lord's prayer after dinner every single night. And we prayed the Catholic prayer to, uh, begin our dinners and we did the daily bread every night as a family after after dinner and and but it was all rituals so there was no relationship and then people will often ask me you know how in the world a did you survive when they hear about all the details but the second is how in the world did you become a christian and it really became understanding the relationship that it had to be a relationship and i had to i had to dig into what does it mean to have a relationship with god and so I get mad, like I said earlier, at the enemy having any impact in my life. So running from the things when, when you, when you, when I really focus on what has God called me to, and I lean into that and I'm clear about how the enemy speaks to me and I'm clear about the tactics that he uses when he comes, I can see it and I can avoid it and I can rebuke it. And, and even if it's a friend, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, you do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of man. And being able to be clear about what things are from God and what things are from man and what things are from the enemy helps us be able to run from the things that are sinful. Because it, all it does is he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And, and when we think about being a weapon of righteousness, and then still killing, killing and destroying. We want to be a weapon of righteousness and not allow the enemy to come in and, and taint that in any way. It was, uh, let me see here. I asked Jesus to forgive me in 1986. And I had a young lady who messaged me, direct messaged me this morning. And she said, I don't know how we became friends on Facebook, but I need to talk to you. And she talked a lot about this, about being ritual. She feels guilty. She does what she's supposed to do. She follows really hard, but she feels guilty all the time that she's not living up to the standard. And, and so I wrote in here, uh, I didn't really believe I was forgiven until 2012. So from 1986 to 2012 is a long time, 30 some odd years, right? And it wasn't until that moment in time when I got on my knees before God and I am asking him to please be with me. I, I cannot do any of this without you. And I was genuinely completely surrendered, just completely surrendered when God showed up and he showed me that he no longer looks at my sin. He no, he no longer looks at my sin because Jesus died for my sin. He made that super clear to me. Jesus held out his hand to me and he said, let's go play. And I couldn't respond to him because I, I was so, felt so guilty and ashamed. And, I, and God said, I don't look at that anymore. I do not look at it anymore. And he paid the price so that I don't have to. And I was stunned by the fact that all of these years I had been acting and reacting as a Christian but didn't believe that I was truly forgiven. And then at a moment in time, I'm like, wow, he is so not interested in looking at my old junk, but interested in my future and utilizing me as a weapon of righteousness, as a child, as a, as a, as a loving, loved daughter, and to be able to walk in that every day. That's what God is interested in. And the enemy is interested in keeping us focused backwards. God is interested in looking at us now and into the future. And so I was following the rules of religion. 
That's what I was doing, the rules of religion. Now I, I need to let you know that um, I do have certain distinct battles in my life. I'm not here to say, wow, you know, I just, I'm perfect. And I, I, I don't want you to hear that. Don't want you to hear that. When God shows me something, that there's something that he needs to eradicate, it's very clear and it's a distinct battle. It is a battle. I need to know which tools to use, how to use them and to employ them and to not wait. Don't wait. When when God shows you something, you just you just get down and you get to business because otherwise the longer you wait, the harder it becomes. Yeah, to eradicate the footholds of evil. So if the enemy has a foothold in your life, you just need to eradicate it. And again, when you think about it, I was set up for failure with all the stuff that I was exposed to. It's like you, the enemy just, just keeps on trying. We'll try, let's try this door, this door, this door. He keeps poking. And then to be able to say, I'm going to eradicate every foothold that the enemy has in my life. So when forgiveness becomes real, I became so excited about tr being truly forgiven that sin became disinteresting. I was so excited about the life and I went down. I'm like, can you guys believe how much God loves you? Can you believe? And I was going to everybody that I knew because they were believers. And I'm like, I can't believe I didn't know this. And do you believe this? And I wanted other people who were excited about it and who were passionate about it, who were, who were, who were focused on let's go share this, this deep understanding of the forgiveness of God. And here I'd been a pastor for years and a therapist for years. And I, and I apologize. I said, for those people who came to me for, for therapy before that, I felt really bad because I thought I didn't even understand the basics of forgiveness, that I could live forgiven and walk in that every day. So the benefits, what did I write? The benefits, the benefits to dying to sin. So again, the topic here is dying well. We talked about dying, which is the end, right? The permanent ending of vital things, right? The permanent ending. And then to die well is, is, is to die to sin. How do we die to sin? Okay, we've kind of covered that. And the benefits. So one of the examples that I use, and I love this example, is, is called the playground example. And many of you have seen around swimming pools, those wrought iron fences that, you know, they're six to eight feet tall that go around swimming pools. So I want you to imagine um, a playground that has that wrought iron fencing around it. And it's the playground of God. And inside there is just like all sorts of cool things to do. And he's come on in, let's have a good time. So you can go in and you can just focus on all the things that he has, has availed for you and live with the joy and the happiness of that. And there's going to be some people who go and they're like, well, why is a fence here? There's going to be other people who stand there and they, they look like, like they're in a jail with their hands on the fence and looking out and go, well, what's out there? How come I can't go out there? And then there's gonna be other people who crawl up over the fence and run away to go experience the things that God is protecting us from. And we can decide to live within the bounds of what God has, has provided for us and live this life full of joy. And it is a spiritual relationship. It's a spiritual joy. It is not, oh, my life is gonna be easy and fun and, and everything good is going to come my way. Every spiritual good thing will come your way. It has to be a spiritual relationship. The second thing I want you to think about is what would Lazarus be doing? Think about when they finally got those grave, he's like, Lazarus, come forth. And so Lazarus comes out of the grave and they take all of his clothes off of him. What do you, what do you think Lazarus did? Did he, did he sit around and go, well, you know, I kind of believe Jesus did this. And I kind of, you know, and so I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm Lazarus. And I mean, I think he'd be just running through the streets telling everybody, oh my gosh, like I was dead and look at me now. And this is just so exciting. And he would go around telling everybody. So imagine that perce perception and you living in that every day because you've, you're dead to sin and alive to Christ. What would your life be like without sin? If you, if you, if you knew no more sin, I'm, I'm dead, I'm dead to sin and I'm going to walk in new life. What would that look like? And, and have clarity of the vision. If, if we have clarity of the vision, it gives us a goal to reach for every single day, walk, coming up saying, yeah, I'm, a, I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to Christ. And I'm going to go walk and live like that every day. Who would be, so I want you to answer this question. Who would be the first person who would notice that you have died to sin well? Who would be the first person to notice that you have died to sin well? So we're talking about dying well. 
We've talked about what it means to die. We've talked about what it means to um, die to sin, right? Yes, clarity of the vision, absolutely. And don't wait. Yes, don't wait. Don't wait to eradicate. Yes, die to sin well. About that we're dying well, and then the and then the benefits of dying well. Think about the impact that it would have on the world. We really die well. We're dead to sin. We are an instrument, a weapon, a weapon. I love that terminology, a weapon of righteousness. Yes, my husband would know this first. Yes, those around us. Those around us would just, wow, you, you've died well. We can die well today. We don't have to die well when we die physically. We die to sin today. And so I hope that uh, you have really spent some time thinking about dying well. What does it mean to die well? Yes, my husband, my family. Yeah, what <laughs> Jesus would know first. Exactly. I love that, Angie. Yes. Yeah, Sigrid says my wife, my wife, sorry, my spouse and my daughter. Yes. So esposo y su hija. Yes, verdad. Yes, um, absolutely. Close friends. To die to sin well and, and to be excited about that. So I have a prayer here and, and I want to pray that. And I also, uh, let's see here. And if... So I have a prayer. I'm going to read this prayer to you, and I want you to receive this for yourself. So again, we're talking about eradicating the enemy, the power of the enemy in our life, and then and then living well after we have died well. So let's pray. Through the authority of Jesus' name and blood, I pray. Father God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I beg you to have mercy on me, your child, and relieve me from my darkness, distress, and torture by the evil one. I beg you to break all curses and bonds that have been spoken upon me by others or even myself. Reveal to me your truth and your power over evil. Give me visions of a healed and free self. Give me courage to stand strong and to claim your ownership of my life and rebuke and deny the enemy and the enemy's tactics and lies. Give me dreams of your plan for my life let me freely express hope and anticipation of the days ahead in pure relationship with you. Fill me with your spirit. Open my heart to receive love and be cleansed of fear. Give me a desire to read your word and join your people. Free my mind to think of the things that are reputable, lovely, kind, generous, joyful, peaceful, and full of faith. Amen. Amen. And I do have copies of that. If you uh, message me later and want a copy of that, I can um, um, send that to you. And so one of the last benefits of dying to sin. I, oh, so the other passage was Romans 6. So all those other passages that I read were in Romans 6. This is um, a passage in Matthew. Uh, and this is when Jesus was um, talking to his disciples and he was asking them, who do, this, who, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. And, and I love that. I love that. The gates of hell cannot overcome the church when the church is dead to sin, alive in Christ, and being used as, as weapons of righteousness. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so my homework for you as we finish this. So again, we talked about what, it, what, it, what is death, the definition of death, how to die well, and then the benefits of dying well. I want you to finish this sentence. And so somebody type this in. Because I died well to sin blank will blank because i died well to sin blank will blank and i want you to fin i want you to finish that sentence i want you to take some time and really allow god to speak to you 
when I die well to sin, this is the result. And so the, the ways that I, yes, because I died well to sin, blank will blank. Absolutely. Thank you, Julia. So this is what I wrote. Because I died well to sin, the enemy will once again experience defeat. And I just love that. I just love that. Every time, every time, it's like the enemy once again, once again, I mean, I was set up for failure and the enemy was this thrilled about everything that was happening to me. And every time I lean in and I die to sin well, the enemy experiences defeat. And the second thing is, because I died well to sin, my children will see repentance. My children have seen all of this, you know, in my life. And being able to turn and, and grow and turn away over and over and over again and be committed to the process that the next generations to come can see in my own life that I continue to die to sin. I continue to be used as a weapon of righteousness and they will be able to see it. And it's said, he says in scripture over and over again, my word will not come back void. And we can watch that happen over and over again. And so when I died well to sin, my children get to see repentance, the turning away and experience that. And so once again, um, I hope that uh, this has been a blessing for you. Please tune in every day this week and watch the replay. Share them often with those that um, just need encouragement, to need, need to be reminded of the basics. Often it's just, you know, what is Jesus doing? What is God doing? And, and being reminded of the power of resurrection as we go through this week. And so thank you so much. And I hope to uh, see you all again soon. Love you. Take care.